Well, I mean, the process of, of discovery and encounter is a mutual one. People often think that, you know, Māori are just sitting on the shore waiting for Abel Tasman or James Cook to turn up, but that's certainly not the case. It, it's a two-way process in Māori uh, exploring the world themselves. Um, by the early 1800s, large numbers of Māori are travelling across the globe. And so they're forming ideas about Europeans, not just from their experiences within New Zealand, but also on the streets of Sydney, London, New York. Um, some Māori even travelled to places like India. In 1840, as the treaty has been signed, um, Tuati is on the United States expedition exploring Antarctica. So it's just incredible the um, the places that Māori visited and the number of Māori travellers in the period before 1840. And that forms a strong part of their worldview in terms of influencing their ideas about the treaty and what it might mean for their future relationship with these, news com with these newcomers. Well, the Declaration of Independence from, was, from James Busby's perspective, it was intended to, to block a threat from Duterte, who was threatening to set up a sort of independent state in Northland. Um, and so his objective is, is to block that. Um, but he's, he's got wider ideas as well. Um, Busby arrives in New Zealand with a, an idea of, of kind of ruling indirectly through the chiefs, through the Rangatira, by um, encouraging a centralised form of governance that he can then manipulate and influence to um, extend his own um, ideas and authority across the country. And he's quite clear about this in some of his letters, that that's his aim. So he has an ulterior motive. Um, but at the same time, Māori themselves are experimenting, experimenting with new forms of governance because um, in the process of welcoming Pākehā to New Zealand, they're also experiencing problems and issues for the first time ever, um, such as um, disputes about the ownership of new items, the influence of Christianity, um, uh, is it, is it justified for a Christian Māori to go to war, for example? You know, some of these deep philosophical issues. And so Māori are embracing um, different ideas for the way that they can um, exert control over their communities at a time when they have all of these, these challenges. And, for example, they're adopting um, a committee process through, which is initially modelled on what they see of the missionaries who have their own missionary committees that, that they use to administer their communities. But later these committees become fully independent of the missionaries and um, they, they become something that's not just a mere mimicking of European institutions but something something that's quite bicultural. So there are both Māori and Pākehā influences behind them. Well, yeah, Busby was, you know, often decried as the man of war without guns, but I think people recognise in recent times that his position was a bit more nuanced than that, and he had an understanding of the limitations of his role here. And um, so his his best opportunity to, to try and do anything was to um, influence things behind the scenes. So, yeah, indirect rule was his, his overriding objective. Well, there, there are a number of things to consider when we look at what Māori might have understood of, of the treaty. Uh, the, the first thing is that Māori society is still overwhelmingly an oral culture at that time. And so, although there are a lot of arguments among linguists about the text of the, the, the two different versions of the treaty and what they may, might mean, probably the more important thing is what were the explanations given to Māori through the various treaty signing ceremonies. And also the second thing is that Rangatira placed a lot of store on the relationships that they had with other people. And so, for example, the missionaries had a fairly instrumental role in persuading many Māori communities to sign the treaty. And that was often based on the personal relationships that they'd established with those communities. And so these are, these are factors that influence whether um, the, the, the way that Māori view the treaty. And so the fact that, for example, Henry Williams is, is telling Northern Māori that the treaty is a good thing and encouraging them to sign it is, is influential. 
Well, even today people debate what the crown is. It's, it's a very abstract concept and its meaning changes and evolves over time. It has done many times in New Zealand history. Um, so I very much doubt that Māori had a clear idea of that in 1840. On the other hand, they would have had some ideas and experiences of what a kawana was, for example, from the many Māori who visited um, Sydney. And quite a few of them, uh, especially the important rangatira, were hosted by the governor there. One of the very important relationships that Northern Māori first strike up is with Philip Gidley King, who's the governor of Norfolk Island. And in 1793, two young rangatira from the north, Tuki and Huru, are kidnapped and taken to Norfolk Island. And there they're befriended by the governor. They live with his family. After six months, King returns them to New Zealand. And um, that kind of establishes a relationship for, for Napui from, from the early 1790s that carries on through to 1840. Um, by 1805, King is, has become governor of New South Wales, and he hosts very many Māori chiefs there, including Te Pahi, which is... Te Pahi goes there in 1805, and that's kind of like the first sort of state visit or diplomatic visit that a New Zealand rangatira makes overseas. It's an incredibly important trip. Te Pahi goes to visit King, stays with him. They talk about things like how should um, whalers and sealers who are starting to visit New Zealand be treated and what happens if they abuse Māori and what can King do, do to stop that and so on. So you've got this relationship underway in the early 19th century and Māori and Pākehā authorities and leaders are talking to one another about the, the problems that they have and how those might be solved. So this is not a new thing in 1840. It's It's the... It's part of an evolving process. Well, the numbers are very large, and there are, there are later reports that, that Māori are uh, alarmed by that. Although it takes a very long time for that process to play out. Um, even as late as 1858, the numbers are roughly equal, and um, across the North Island, um, Māori are still dominant. Most most Europeans are in the South Island in the 1850s. So it's a process uh, in terms of the Crown exerting its authority and control that, that takes several decades. And arguably the 1860s is a pivotal decade for that. And so the treaty itself and the signing of the treaty on the one hand it changes things superficially because nominally New Zealand is uh, a British colony and Brit Britain has asserted sovereignty over the country but in reality it doesn't really change anything on the ground at least immediately and over large parts of the country for at least the next two decades Māori continue to control their own affairs um, and that's really in line with the expectations of what they thought would happen with the treaty because one thing we can say that Māori certainly didn't agree to was to cede authority over their own internal affairs. It's very clear that all Māori who signed the treaty had an understanding that they would con continue to govern their own affairs. The debate might be around um, what would happen with uh, matters that related to both Māori and Pākehā, but I think there it's clear that Māori expected that those would be a, something that would be negotiated between Rangatira and the governor. Um, and when that doesn't happen, it becomes a matter of grave disappointment. The process of the Crown exerting control is one that takes several decades to work out. A key turning point is probably in 1852, when New Zealand gets a new constitution. Um, the Europeans in New Zealand have long been um, calling for self-government because up until that time the governor is essentially ruling things himself with a few advisors. So in 1852 New Zealand gets a new constitution from Britain and that constitution sets up a parliament, the predecessor to the parliament that we have today. Um, and it's quite a generous um, provisions in terms of who can vote but the suffrage or the, the entitlement to vote is based on uh, European property holdings most Māori still hold their lands under custom. They don't have they don't have a title from the Crown to those lands, so they're not eligible to vote. So essentially what happens is when Parliament is set up from 1854 onwards, 
is composed solely of Europeans. It exists solely as a, a body that advocates Pākehā interests. Māori are excluded from it entirely, um, and they call for um, their inclusion within that parliament or the setting up of some tandem body that can sit alongside it um, so that their, their vision of what the treaty relationship would be, which is one where both Māori and Pākehā would, would live side by side in a mutually beneficial relationship and work things out together and make rules for the for the governance of the colony together, um, that their uh, aspirations for that are, are ultimately disappointed. By the 1860s, things have changed significantly for one thing, and I think probably the crucial thing is the demographic balance has changed. Um, large numbers of Pākehā have arrived in the country, especially in the 1860s. That's a decade of massive European immigration to New Zealand as a result of the gold rushes and other things. Uh, and also, of course, um, the New Zealand government um, gets the assistance of large numbers of British troops who are sent to New Zealand to put down so-called Māori rebellion. Um, and that's a, that's a very close-run thing. Um, the, the first Taranaki war that's fought between 1860 and 61 probably ends as a stalemate. In 1863, uh, the Waikato district is invaded. Māori are outnumbered four or five to one. Um, the British have artillery, Māori have none. The British have cavalry, Māori have none. Um, the British have a massive logistical um, supply train, Māori don't have that. Uh, and even then, it's, it's a very narrow run thing. Um, the, the Crown claims some kind of victory in the Waikato War, but they they go to war in 1863 to destroy the Kingitanga, and they don't manage to destroy it. It's, it's still around today. So in that sense, um, the Crown's victory is a limited one, sufficient to impose its authority over much of the North Island. But again, that still takes some decades because the King Country, which is the district that the Māori survivors of the Waikato War retreat to, remains autonomous into the 1880s. And then you can look at the um, Bitterweta district, which isn't really opened up to European um, influence and control until the early 20th century. So in all, you know, you've got a process that's unfolding over about six, de six decades after 1840 before the British idea that this means complete control becomes a reality. In the 1970s, you've got a new generation of Māori leaders who are urban, educated, young, and far more radical than their elders. And, and some of their tactics um, upset some of the older people, but it certainly gains attention. And by the mid eighteen, by the mid nineteen seventies, it really becomes impossible to ignore these Māori grievances. Of course, the Māori Land March in nineteen seventy five probably exposes many Pākehā for the first time to the fact that Māori aren't very happy with their situation. Uh, and for much of the twentieth century, um, we get this myth of the greatest race relations in the world, and so on. And this is this is even reflected in in school textbooks and so on, which sort of go on about this and. Um, you know, contrasting the experience of Māori um, with that of uh, Aboriginal people in Australia or, or people in uh, Native Americans in the US and so on. So this, this becomes a kind of a cornerstone of Pākehā national identity is the notion that our natives were treated so much better than Indigenous peoples elsewhere. And of course it doesn't accord with the reality. And so by the 1970s, these two worldviews kind of come into collision with one another. Um, and I think today few would argue or few would continue to sustain the idea that New Zealand has the greatest race relations in the world or that there haven't been problems. So I think that that kind of myth has been largely put to bed, although there are still some, some people who, who kind of cling to it. Well, I, I would argue that a mature nation needs to own its history warts and all. and. So there are these unpleasant aspects of our past, but they're ones that we need to acknowledge and learn about and understand. Because if the treaty relationship is about a dialogue between two peoples, if one of them is not listening to the other, then that's a problem. And so um, I think it's really important that, that we embrace this history and as a nation make, make concerted efforts to understand it and to acknowledge it.
Well, I think the, the treaty is a blueprint for a relationship and it's a relationship that's undergone enormous change uh, and conflict since 1840. But I think the the underlying principles, at least of the Māori signatories to the treaty, are ones that we should uh, keep in mind. And that is about um, the notion that, that the treaty is, is, is founded on a relationship of mutual benefit for both parties and, and both parties wanting to live together in harmony for the for the benefit of all um, and so the treaty doesn't really provide answers as to how we can do that in the 21st century but it lays down the platform and the, and the challenge that that's something that we need to work out together uh, even as the nature of New Zealand society evolves and changes with with different um, types of immigration streams and so on so Tangata Tiriti, the, the, the people of the treaty, um, their makeup has changed significantly since 1840, but I think the treaty is still a valuable blueprint for how that relationship might unfold in the future.